Hello, I'm Brian Young, and this is part two to 26106 device boxes. So as I told you in the first video, uh, let's take a look in the code book at 210.52 and also 314.16 A and B. If you haven't seen part one of 26106 device boxes, I suggest that you go watch part one first and then come back to part two. Let's take a look at the code book. Here I am in article 210, 21052 dwelling unit receptacle outlets. Uh, general provisions, A, 21052A, 21052A1. 21052A general provision says in every kitchen, family room, dining room, living room, parlor, library, den, sunroom, bedroom, re uh, recreation room, or similar room or area of a dwelling unit. That means every room in the house. Receptacle outlets shall be installed in accordance with the general provisions uh, specified in 21052A1 through 4. So one is spacing. It says uh, re Receptacles that shall be installed such that uh, no point measured horizontally along the floor line of any wall space is more than six feet from a receptacle outlet. We call it the 12 foot rule. Wall space as used in this section of wall space shall include the following. Any space two feet or more in width, including space measured around corners and unbroken along the floor line by doorways and similar openings fireplaces, and fixed cabinets. Space occupied by fixed panels and exterior walls, excluding sliding panels. Space afforded by fixed room dividers, such as uh, freestanding bar type counters or uh, railings. Floor receptacles. Receptacle outlets in the floor, in or on floors, shall not be count, uh, counted as part of the requirements uh, required number of receptacles unless located within 18 inches of the wall. So let's real quick take a look at what they just told us. So What they just said is, and this is gonna be a very crude drawing here, my, my uh, smart board for some reason is acting up a little bit today. It's not, it's not doing exactly what I want it to do, but uh, here's a bedroom, here's the door. And here's a bathroom. And here's another bedroom uh, with maybe a closet and maybe a walk-in closet or a bifold door here. And uh, this will be a third bedroom and then this is a big living room and this living room will go off into a dining room and into a kitchen oops well there you go <clears throat> so there in every room within six feet of the door we have to put a receptacle that's a duplex receptacle a circle with two lines is a receptacle. So there's a receptacle, and within 12 feet of that first receptacle, we have to put a second receptacle. And within 12 feet of that second receptacle, we have to put a third receptacle. We have to go around the room putting receptacles everywhere uh, within 12 feet and within six feet of the door. Because it said, uh, no wall space shall be further than six feet from a receptacle measured horizontally at the wall space at the floor line. Uh, a wall that's two feet or greater counts. So if you had, uh, if we had 
a doorway here and a doorway here and this wall is two feet or greater, well, then it counts. We have to put a receptacle on it. What they're trying to do is prevent people from plugging into a receptacle over here and carrying that cord across this doorway. They don't want cords crossing doorways. They don't want cords crossing a fireplace. If you happen to have a fireplace in your living room, you, you, if this is greater than two feet, then you need to have a receptacle on this two foot wall and it's measured around the corner to the doorway. Uh, you're most likely are gonna have to have a receptacle there. It keeps you from plugging into a receptacle over here and stretching the cord past the fireplace. So within six feet of door, every 12 feet around the room, any wall space two feet or greater counts in every room of the house. Then we go on to kitchens. And the kitchen is a little bit more stringent. Receptacle outlets serve small appliances. Receptacles installed for, uh, for countertop surfaces as specified in 250, uh, 21052C shall not be considered as the receptacles required by 21052A. Receptacle outlets served in the kitchen, pantry, breakfast room, dining room, or similar area of a dwelling unit. That means anything that has to do with cooking or eating. The two or more 20 amp small appliance branch circuits required by 21011C1 shall serve all wall and floor receptacle outlets covered by 21052A, all countertop outlets covered by 21052C, and receptacle outlets for refrigeration equipment. And then they give you an exception saying you don't have to put the refrigerator on one of the two small appliance branch circuits. It says in addition to required receptacles specified in 21052, switch receptacle, uh, receptacle supplied from a general purpose branch circuit as defined in 21070A1 for lighting, shall be permitted. The receptacle outlet for refrigeration equipment shall not be permitted or shall be permitted to be apply, uh, supplied from an individual branch circuit rated 15 amps or greater. So you don't have to put that on the small appliance branch circuit. No other outlets. The two or more small appliance branch circuits specified shall have no other outlets and then they give us a couple of exceptions. A receptacle installed solely for the electrical supply to and support of an electric clock. It's a clock outlet in any of the rooms specified in 21052B1. Receptacles installed uh, to provide power for supplemental equipment and lighting on gas fired ranges, ovens, counter mounted cooking units. So if you're using gas and you have an electric striker, that striker is allowed to be fed by one of the two small appliance brand circuits in the kitchen. Okay. And then they go on to say wall countertop space as a receptacle outlet shall be installed at each wall countertop space uh, wider than 12 inches. Receptacle outlets shall be installed so that no point along the wall line is more than 24 inches measured horizontally from a receptacle, so that's every four feet in the kitchen. Any wall space 12 inches or greater counts. Uh, you wouldn't put any behind a sink. So. You don't have to put them behind a sink or a cooktop. If there's a cooktop in the corner, you don't have to put any outlets back here. They don't want you, again, they don't want you to plug in and cross a, go across a sink or a cooktop uh, and harm that. So uh, then they go on to talk about uh, bathrooms and outdoors. You have to have GFCI receptacles, they have to be GFCI protected, but you have to have at least one outlet in the bathroom within three feet of the basin. So we said uh, bathrooms uh, had a basin and a basin and a tub, basin and a, a toilet, a urinal, a uh, bidet. Uh, it says in dwelling units, at least one receptacle shall be uh, installed in bathrooms within three feet of the outside edge of each basin. They want it close to the sink. You'd think they'd want it away from the sink, but they want it close to the sink, and it has to be GFCI protected. The receptacle outlet shall be located on a wall or partition that is adjacent to the basin or basin countertop, located on the countertop or installed on the side or face of the basin cabinet. 
in no case shall the receptacle be located more than 12 inches below the top of the basin and it shall not be mounted face up in that cabinet we don't do that uh so and then they go on to talk about lighting uh 210 70 uh will tell us everywhere in in a in a house that we have to have a lighting outlet oh this also says in the laundry area in dwelling units at least one receptacle shall be installed in areas designated for uh installation of laundry equipment so There's 21070, I knew it was there somewhere. It's at the very bottom of this page, 63. Lighting outlets required. Basically, they tell you every room that is habitable has to have a lighting outlet. Kitchens and bathrooms have to have an actual fixture in the ceiling. All of the rooms can have a switched outlet receptacle, and that can count as your lighting circuit because you can turn it on with the switch at the door. Um, let me jump over here real quick to 314. We were talking about box fill and we wanted to talk about 314, 16A and B. Here's 314, 16A and B. So 314, 16, table 314, 16 will give us standard boxes. Here's round or octagonal boxes and it gives us the dimensions of each four by an inch and a quarter deep, round or octagonal box, four by inch and a half, four by two and an eighth. And it tells us how many number 14s, how many number 12s. We can put nine number 12s in a four by two and an eighth inch round box. That's 21.5 cubic inches. We have square boxes, four by inch and a quarter, inch and a half, two and an eighth. Uh, square boxes that are four and 11 sixteenths, they're larger. And we have device boxes that are for one device, three by two by inch and a half deep, or four by two and a quarter. Now the difference between, uh, excuse me, two and, a, two and an eighth. The difference between a device box that's three by two by some depth, or a device box that's four by two and an eighth by some depth, is that the, the three by two has the screws on the outside of the box. The four by two and an eighth have, to have the mounting screws for the yoke of the device on the inside of the box. That's how they get the larger volume by putting the screws on the inside. They make the box a little bit larger. It's still a single gang box, but it's a little bit larger. So it gives us the cubic inch area. We don't care about centimeters. We're, we don't do metric, but cubic inch area on the right here. And it tells us how many of these number 14s, 12s, 10s we can put in these boxes. Now, we have to do some deductions. Like it tells us that for a four inch by two and an eighth inch square box, we can put 13 number 12s. Unless that box contains other things. If that box contains uh, a device, we have to do some deductions. So here, uh, a 3, 14, 16, we're going to talk about the deductions. Here's 31416, number of conductors and outlet device and junction boxes and conduit bodies. A, the box volume calculation. They're saying to use the uh, volume of the boxes listed in table 31416A. Or if the box is not a standard size, you can measure the dimensions of the box and do the multiplication. And that'll give you the, the cubic inch area. Box fill calculations, conductor fill. Each conductor that originates outside the box and terminates or is spliced within the box shall be counted once. And each conductor that passes through the box without a splice or termination shall be counted once. Each loop or coil of unbroken conductor, not less than twice the minimum length required for free conductors in 300.14 shall be counted twice is you can cut it in the middle and then you have two six inch pieces. The conductor fill shall be calculated using table 31416B, a conductor no part of which leaves the box shall not be counted. And then they have an exception here. It says an equipment grounding conductor uh, or conductors plural or not over four fixture wires smaller than 14 gauge 
uh, or both shall be permitted to be omitted from the calculation where they enter the box from a domed luminaire or a similar canopy and terminate within that box. So let's take a look. Uh, let's go to our smart board and talk about what we just read. And this is what we just read. Here's a box. Here's a conduit or a cable. I'm just going to call it a conduit. Romex counts the same way. Here's a conductor. It originates outside the box and terminates inside the box and it counts once. Here's a conductor that passes through the box unbroken and it counts once. Here's a conductor that originates outside the box and exits the box unbroken, but it's got a, a 12 inch loop. Well, we could cut that 12 inch loop in the middle and we'd have two six inch conductors. So this 12 inch loop counts as two conductors because we could cut it in the middle and we'd have two six inch conductors. So a six inch conductor counts once, a conductor that passes through the box unbroken counts once, a conductor that loops in the box counts twice. A conductor, no part of which leaves the box. Here's a grounding pigtail that's screwed in the back of the box and it's six inches long. It never left the box. It's not counted. We don't count it. A conductor, no part of which leaves the box shall be counted. Uh, this is a side view of a box. Well, that's a horrible, horrible. All right, hold on. This thing is messing with me here. Let me move my hair. Here's a side view and here's a canopy. Here's a fixture and that fixture is for a lamp holder there. So we can screw in a light bulb. There, there's my light bulb. No more than four conductors that enter the box from this canopy, including an equipment ground, and I don't have a gray for a neutral. I'll use this dotted one for the neutral. Those, none of those have to be counted because they're smaller than number 14. They enter the box from a canopy on a fixture and uh, uh, they terminate inside the box. We, we don't count, okay? All right, now, now that we've looked at this, let's go back and read that section again. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will read the section while you look at this drawing. And it says, each conductor that originates outside the box and, is, and terminates or is spliced within the box shall be counted once. That's this one. And each conductor that passes through the box without splices or terminations shall be counted once. That's the red one. Each loop or coil of unbroken conductor that uh, let not less than twice the minimum length required for free conductor in 300.14, that's six inches, shall be counted twice. The conductor fill shall be calculated using table 314.16b. A conductor, no part of which leaves the box, that's that green one, shall not be counted. And then it says an equipment grounding conductor or conductors or not over four fixture wires, smaller than number 14 gauge or both, shall be permitted to be uh, omitted from the calculations where they enter a box from a domed Luminaire, there's your domed luminaire, or similar canopy and terminate within the box. Okay. So now let's look at uh, B, clamp or two, clamp fill, where one or more in internal cable clamps, whether factory or field supplied, are present in a box. A single volume allowance in accordance with table 31416b shall be made based on the largest conductor present in the box. 
No allowance shall be required for a cable connector with the clamping mechanism outside the box. I'm not gonna read all that. That's all new, I'm not gonna worry about that. While I'm here, let me read about support fittings. Where one or more luminaire studs or hickeys are present in a box, a single volume allowance in accordance with Table 3, 14, 16b shall be made for each type of fitting based on the largest conductor present in the box. Okay, so let's go back to our smart board and take a look at what we just said. So what did we just say? Where's my hair? Uh, So here's a box, and I'm gonna. Well, I need to. I need to draw a ceiling box. Let me draw a ceiling box. This is an old-fashioned ceiling box. It's, oh man, this thing is really acting up today. There. There. There's an old-fashioned ceiling box, and in the back of the box is a three-eighths dud. It's threads that you can screw stuff to. That's a fixture stud. Fixture stud. Now I'm also going to tell you that a fixture stud can be a piece of all thread that's hollow that you can, it's threaded, and you can run wires through it. So there's my piece of all thread that's hollow, you can run wires through it. That's also a fixture stud. A fixture hickey is a thing that looks like this. Boom, boom, boom. Here's one side of it. Here's the other side of it. Uh, I will tell you, I've been in the trade for 30 years now, and I've only ever seen two of these in the wild. I've only ever seen two fixtures, fix, fixture hickeys, and it was they were both on demo, demolition jobs. So here's the box with a fixture stud. You can take that fixture hickey and you can screw it on to that fixture stud. And now you can take this fixture stud and you can screw it in here. And basically, it gives you a place for your wires to go through, and it gives you a stud that you can put a hex nut on and hold a fixture in place. So if you have one or more fixture studs, it's a deduction of one. One deduction for a fixture stud. One deduction for a fixture hickey. Hickey, okay? One or more. So it doesn't matter if you had two, three, or four of them in the box. If you have one or more, it's a deduction of one conductor, according to uh, 31416B. So I want to take a look at 31416B now, just so you know what I'm talking about when we're saying 31416B. Here's 31416B, and it gives us a cubic inch area for the size of wire. A number 14 wire is two cubic inches. A number 12 wire is two and a quarter cubic inches of volume in the box. A number 10 is two and a half. A number eight is three. A number six is five. They're not saying they did the math and did uh, pi r squared, you know, the, the radius of the, dia the, the wire or cross-sectional area times six inches. They didn't do that. Basically, they're saying you have to give me this much space for a number 12 wire, two and a quarter cubic inches for cooling so that that wire can dissipate heat in the box and not overheat. It's all about heat. So we have to deduct uh, one conductor based on the size of the conductor. We're going to deduct a certain number of cubic inch area of, of that box. Just like we set up here, we have a, a device box that's three by two by inch and a half. And we said it was 7.5 cubic inches. Well, if we had to deduct two and a quarter inches from that, now all of a sudden we're down to 5.25 cubic inches that we can put wire in. We have to deduct wires from that box.
Okay. And that's what they're talking about. So if you have a fixture stud or a fixture hickey, you have to deduct one wire. If you have a, uh, uh, oh, a cable clamp. I didn't do the clamps. Uh, clamp fill. Or one more internal cable clamp, whether factory or field supplied or present in a box, a single volume allowance in accordance with table 31416B shall be made based on the largest conductor present in the box. So, let me real quick go back to that because uh, we didn't talk about the cable clamps. Um, some boxes have, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you'll be able to see my, uh, there, my perspective here. We're looking inside the box. We've got a single device box and we're looking inside the box. And back here on the back of the box is a thing that looks like that. Basically, it's a cable clamp. It looks like this. And then there's a screw and that screw tightens it up, tightens down on it. And your, your Romax, your cables, go up underneath these two and that's a cable clamp. And then you tighten it up and it holds that Romex. You come in from a hole in the top of the box, you bring that Romex in, and then you tighten it down. That's a cable clamp. You have to have one deduction for that cable clamp if the clamping mechanism is inside the box. If your clamping mechanism is outside the box, like uh, a Romex connector, here's a box, and then here's a Romex connector where the threads go inside the box, but the clamping mechanism is outside the box. You don't have to make it, you don't have to do a deduction for that because the only thing inside the box is just the threads and the lock nut. The clamping mechanism is outside the box. You don't have to do any deductions for that. <clears throat> okay. So here it says uh, where one more internal cable clamp whether factory or field supplied are present in a box, a single volume allowance in accordance with table 31416B shall be made based on the largest conductor present in the box. No allowance shall be required for a cable connector with its clamping mechanism outside the box. Okay. And this is about fiber optic. That's why I'm skipping it. It's, it, it we don't need that right now. Support fittings. So we're going to talk about the yoke of... Uh, uh, luminaire stud or hickey, there you go. We talked about luminaire studs and hickeys. Where one or more uh, luminaire stud or hickey are present in a box, a single volume allowance in accordance with table 31416B shall be made for each type of fitting. So if you have one or more luminaire studs, it's a deduction of one. If you have one or more uh, fixture hickeys, it's a deduction of one. The device or equipment fill, this is the yoke. For each yoke or strap containing one or more device or equipment, a double volume allowance in accordance with table 31416B shall be made for each yoke or strap based on the largest conductor connected to a device or equipment supported by the yoke or strap. A device or utilization equipment wider than a single two inch device box as described in table 31416A I'll have double volume allowances provided for each gang required for mounting. So let's see what that means. What they're saying is um, we have a box. Do, do, do. Oh, well, all right. I don't want a red box there. We have a box, and this box, a uh, single gang box is for a device and the device is held on by a metal strap and that metal strap is called a yoke and maybe this is a switch. So here's my switch and here's the yoke. Hold, that's a terrible, terrible drawing of a yoke. But there's the yoke holding the switch in place. We have to deduct two wire sizes for that yoke. Even if that yoke has two receptacles, 
a duplex receptacle is actually two receptacles. So if we have a yoke and that yoke is holding two devices, meaning a duplex receptacle, it's still two deductions because they're deducting for the wires that are terminating to screws on that device. So there's a hot and here's a neutral and there and there's a ground and the ground only counts once. Whoops, I didn't give me the green for the ground. There you go. There's the ground wire. We would do a deduction of two for the one for the hot, one for the neutral. For the wires that are terminating to the device on that yoke, we would do two deductions. It also said that if you have a device that's wider than a single device box, if you have to put it in a two gang box, if you have a 50 amp range receptacle that's filling this box up and it's mounted on, oops, I'm gonna use a different color here. It's mounted on a yoke and that yoke mounts to the box, but that receptacle is so big that it takes up two gangs. Now we have to make two deductions for each gang. So we have to deduct four times the largest wire size that's terminated to that device. If we're using number six wire, because it's a 50 amp receptacle, we have to do five cubic inches, inches cubed times four. So that's 20 cubic inches just for that device, because it's taking up that much volume in the box. So we have to deduct the number of wires for that 20 cubic inches. All right. And then equipment ground, it just says one deduction for equipment grounds. Equipment grounding conductor fill where one or more equipment grounding conductors or equi uh, bo equipment bonding jumpers enters a box, a single volume allowance in accordance with table 31416B shall be made based on the largest conductor in the grounding group. So it's one deduction for a ground wire. All right, so that's how you use these two tables. Here's 31416A that tells us the number of conductors we can have in a box, but then we have to deduct for, uh, Wires that terminate in the box, wires that pass through the box. We have to deduct two for wires that make a loop in the box. We have to deduct two for each yoke, one for each ca uh, cable clamp, one for each fixture hickey or fixture stud, and one for the equipment grounding conductor. And then whatever we're left with here, if we started with uh, 13 and we did five deductions, we can only have eight wires in that box. Okay, well, I'm sure that this has uh, left you with many, many questions. Read that chapter, read it thoroughly, get your code book and read Article 314. Pay special attention to 314.16. Read about the, dedu the, dedu the deductions and read about table 31416A and 31416B. Read Article 210.52, where receptacles are located in a dwelling unit. Read 210.70, where switches are located in a dwelling unit. This is going to give you a lot of knowledge. Just those sections, 210.52, 210.70, 314.16, read those sections. If you have questions, ask your instructor. I hope that you found these videos informative. And as always, work safe, work smart, and wear your PPE. It's there to protect you. Thank you.